All right, well, thank you uh, very much, Paul, for uh, in inviting me back to the Toronto Centre. If I sound a little different than I usually do, it's because I have a terrible cold, and I didn't know whether I'd be able to make it tonight. So I've got this, you know, deep, sexy, husky voice. Um, that, that's what I call it anyway. So I seem to be invited back here every time I go to Australia, and that has actually been uh, five times in the, in the last four years. Um, and uh, this time was a, a little bit different. So this is uh, what I'm calling this talk, obviously the down under part. Uh, and uh, I think that what you will probably find interesting is the with a defective mount part. Um, and uh, this uh, produced a lot of uh, angst, as I will uh, describe uh, to you, and threaten, frankly, to uh, scuttle the uh, entire astronomical part of this trip. So this was our uh, this was our itinerary for this particular trip. And yes, really, it was 11,000 kilometers, uh, starting in Alice Springs in the middle, driving down to the Barossa Valley, obviously to pick up some wine, uh, back up all the way to the north to Kakadu National Park, uh, and then back to Alice Springs with some astronomy. Uh, in the middle, and we've um, done uh, this this trip, you know, several times uh, before. So I had three observing sites during this time, and uh, and here they were, and I put in the latitudes there as well. And so obviously, you know, we're we're um, uh, you know between 20 and 25 degrees uh, south of the uh, of the equator. And and the result of all of that, I've asked this before. Uh, how many people here have been in the southern hemisphere? All right, well, those of you who do then, uh, or have been, if you go at the right time of year, have observed the Milky Way and the center of, the, uh, the center of our galaxy in the big bulge directly overhead as compared with uh, what we see, sort of the fleeting glimpse about uh, 20 degrees above the horizon uh, in our summertime. And uh, so this time, uh, the, the particular reason for going this time was, as some of you may have um, read about and read articles about uh, in at the end of October uh, authorities in Australia closed Uluru Ayers Rock for climbing permanently now I first climbed the rock in 1983 and uh, I'd done it three more times and so with our daughter my wife Helen and I wanted to climb it one more time and so we decided to go in September before it closed and we did and there we are on the top it's a highly political issue in Australia but it's now closed uh, forever uh, one of the things that I've done that Aussies have never even heard of believe it or not I swam on top of Ayers Rock Uluru in 1986 during um, uh, uh, a particularly rainy uh, period at that time. So, uh, on this particular trip, this was the telescope I, I took. How many people here, I've just got the light in my eyes, how many people here uh, are on the RSC list, Rascals? Okay, well, so some, of, all right, some of you, okay, so some of you will then have seen my posts and you may have bothered to take a look at some of the photos that I have posted uh, from that. So this was the telescope that, uh, that I took and, and uh, people are always asking, so I thought I would, I would let you know. So this is a, a 127 millimeter diameter, five inch diameter telescope, and yeah, it's an expensive telescope. It's really an astrophotographic telescope. Uh, it's beautiful visually as well. In previous trips, I had taken only camera lenses up to 400 millimeters, and then I got the um, 101 uh, millimeter four inch uh, Teleview a few years ago, took that down. I really liked that one. And then I decided that I would move up to their uh, their largest size. But that required a new mount because it's, it's a really heavy sucker. It doesn't look all that big, but it's really quite heavy. And uh, so what I decided to do, well, all right, so here is the, this, this is the telescope. This is on the Teleview uh, website. And uh, that's what it uh, looks like, what it comes in packed uh, in a very nice case. And, uh, and these are the reviews that have come out uh, about it. It's been out for uh, 10 years or more now. Uh, and I can tell you that's a pretty great thing. Now, one of the things that I am um, using a telescope like this, I use Telrad Finder all the time. That's really easy to use. But one of the problems is that Telrad has a low profile. And, uh, and when you put it in the, in the, um, on the telescope, close to the telescope, inside the mounting rings, it's really hard to, to move around and to move the telescope. And so I found that you can uh, get these risers then that lift the Telrad up 
um, many centimeters above your tube. You can turn the tube, and uh, I got a couple of these, and they're really fantastic. And so I have mounts on both sides of the tube uh, with these risers. Really inexpensive. You can pick them up in the States, uh, get them shipped up here, and, uh, and they're really quite terrific. Okay, how are we doing here? All right, so there you go. That's You see the tail red mounted on top. Something that makes your observing and object finding, if you're not necessarily using GoTo at the time, really, really easy. Okay, so uh, because I needed a mount that could accommodate a greater uh, payload, I decided and read up and decided that I would go with uh, this Ioptron um, mount, the CEM40EC, which has a um, payload uh, capacity of 40 kilograms. Now, what's really interesting about this, and I had some trepidation about it, I think that you can see uh, here, there's no, uh, there's no polar scope there. But what you can, and this is uh, what it looks like packed in its nice little box, and you know it's really, uh, you know, a pretty great looking uh, little mount. Uh, and here we have the electronic polar scope. Now this is supposed to be the greatest thing. It's not uh, your typical visual through the uh, axis. Uh, polar scope where you've got the star pattern and you just move the the, the um, uh, mount around until you've got you're centered on in the northern hemisphere well not centered on but you uh, coordinate with Polaris and then the southern hemisphere somewhat more difficult but with the fainter star six magnitude star Sigma Octantis the year before um, in uh, in May 2018 I had um, a, uh, a Skywatcher mount, uh, the EQ5, and it, it's a really nice mount, has a polar scope. I never had difficulty getting a polar alignment with that, with the straight through polar scope. Uh, even in the Southern Hemisphere, people say it's so difficult to do it in, an, uh, in octans. I have not found it difficult. After, uh, you know, by the second night, I was able to get a really good polar alignment in about five minutes. So it wasn't a problem, and I thought that this would be even better from what I had read. I've never used it. Uh, a computer at the telescope. This requires a computer at the telescope. Okay, fine, I took it. You get an alignment, you turn your computer off, and then you go. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the advertising suggests that it is just the greatest thing. Uh, and and um, so the way it, it works is, right, this, is the, this is the advertising, the way it works is that it has a little camera that takes a picture of the star pattern and it solves the star pattern, north or south, southern hemisphere, and it, and it tells you exactly then where the actual pole is, and you're not going to be right on it, and it will tell you how much you are off on the computer screen, and then you move your uh, scope uh, using the uh, uh, um, altitude and azimuth controls until you're right on it. And the way it works, so this is what your computer screen uh, looks like. The actual pole, again, it'll take a photograph and you can do various settings for length of exposure and so on, faintest stars. It takes a photograph. These are the stars that it will show. These are the stars that it's supposed to show. Uh, and here is where the pole, it tells you the pole actually is, and this is where your, your RA axis is actually pointing. And so what you then need to do is simply move the RA axis carefully in both axes until you've got the two aligned. It's very close now, and you do just a little tweak, and now you are right aligned with the pole. And they say that it's easy, and it's fast, and it works all the time. Um, it does not. <laughs> and I discovered this. I, I, I tested it out in, in Canada, and the first night uh, at Algonquin Park, uh, it didn't work really all that well. Second night, it seemed to work fine. And I got some decent, uh, some decent photographs. And so when I tested it up here, yeah, it did work fine, and uh, took photographs. Uh, this was uh, this is how it is mounted. I can tell you one other thing. You know, Ioptron produces some really good stuff, but they just don't think about things uh, very much. It's supposed to be able to. Uh, this it, it, it's a large telescope with a camera on and so on, but it's nowhere near 40 kilograms. They give you one crappy little counterweight, and there's no damn way, even on a long axis like this, that it can remotely, remotely counterbalance the weight of a telescope uh, of the advertised weight. These are Skywatcher counterweights that I had and that I had to use. I contacted Ioptron about that and they said in an email back, oh yeah, we've been talking about that. 
thanks. So anyway, it is actually mounted, uh, you know, and balanced this way. Here you see a, a ball head. I should tell you as well, these, um, uh, this red saddle, I, it's really hard to find really high quality mounting rings for astrophotography uh, that precisely fit your tube. Uh, frankly, I think the Teleview ones aren't all, uh, aren't, aren't all that good for a scope of this quality. I found a, um, an Italian company, whoop, Go backwards, sorry. I found an Italian company, um, uh, Prima uh, Luce Lab, and uh, ordered them, got them delivered in about a month and a half from there, and they work. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Not inexpensive, but really, really nice, and uh, that's what I mounted. So I did some test photography, uh, started early in the summer, and uh, you know, did manage to get some decent stuff. Here's uh, the well-known uh, M24 star cloud, which is uh, the, the oddest of all of the Messier objects because it's a big star cloud and it isn't a, a definable open cluster galaxy, globular cluster, planetary nebula. Uh, but I, I, I like that one, and I had a really good night in uh, in Algonquin Park with a lot of uh, Barnard uh, dark clouds, as you can see here. Uh, similarly, M11, the famous wild duck, everybody loves that uh, open cluster in uh, constellation Scutum. Um, this one is actually a really interesting one. I'd never shot this one before, and uh, so this is in Cepheus, and these actually are two quite different colors, which you don't often see in uh, emission slash uh, reflection nebulae. Uh, and then uh, obviously the North American Nebula and over on the right side the Pelican Nebula and so I was pretty happy this uh, these are photos made with a new scope I was pretty happy with how it was uh, was working and I thought that I would have no trouble in Australia okay so we uh, head back uh, we head down in, into the south and uh, here I am so we have telescope we have an astronomer. We have <laughs> necessary accessories, um, you know, which was always fun. When you got long exposures, you got a lot of sipping time, right? Uh, and so here is the scope set up. Telescope and the mount. Yes, thank you, Skywatcher. Working closely together with Ioptron. My uh, the Astro camera the and I think you know this you've seen photos made with this one before a dedicated Astro camera and then the Finder and here then you can see the um, the electronic scope and the little camera on the front then you connect the and I ha don't have it here but you connect up your computer to it you plug it in there you start the software it solves for the stars supposedly. But, uh, oh yes, and the, uh, my favorite ball head, which is really good for holding up to 400 millimeter telephoto lenses. Um, and so this is what happens when the polar scope does not work. And, and I'm going to give you an example of, of good tracking. And so we know what this is. There was some discussion, uh, it was mentioned before, H and Chi Percy, the double cluster. This is a, this is a full frame. Right, and that's the number of pixels that you get uh, in this camera. And what I did is I took a full-size crop, so a tiny little portion, full-size crop, so you can see that the star image is ah, pretty good, pretty round, and no wonder that you're going to get those you know, fairly pinpoint images in your final, proce in your final uh, processed image. As compared with what I ended up with in Southern Hemisphere, and what happened is a whole bunch of things happened. First of all, it wouldn't pick up the stars. Secondly, um, the, 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 and, and, and these are very clear nights. Then it would pick up stars, but where it said the pole was, the little round dot went all over the screen and then disappeared completely. So I had no idea where it was. Uh, yeah, oh, the X was there, but I had no idea where the actual virtual pole was. And that went on, and, and as a result of that, I had no confidence whatsoever that the thing was working. By the way, I had emails back and forth with my dealer here and then with Ioptron, and they suggested, well, there might be several things. Are there any trees in the way? I'm in the outback, <laughs> you know, et cetera. Anyway, they were unable to figure it out uh, at all. And the result is that I had to do manual attempts at, at um, uh, alignment with a little, a little protractor and a compass. Well, how close do you think I got? Not very. And so, uh, you know, I'd spent a lot of money and done a lot of planning 
to get this scope and all this equipment down to Australia. And so what happens um, when you have bad tracking? <laughs> and so here is the small Magellanic cloud, full frame. Now you may think, oh, that doesn't look too bad. This is one frame, by the way, just one frame. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing, a little crop, 100% crop. That's it. Well, you can, um, and, and that's the best I could get because the scope was not aligned because the electronic polar scope did not work. I don't know whether it's a design problem. I don't know whether I just got a bad one. Um, I'm not going to talk about what I've been doing about it. But anyway, the star images were terrible. Nonetheless, I was able to get something. But what it forced me to do was to take very short exposures and boost the setting ISO way up high so that over the course of the exposure, you wouldn't get too much trailing. And then because of the processing and the fact that you know they're always reduced to um, essentially 1080 pixels high, the bad tracking gets masked, gets hidden to some extent. And I also do, as I think a lot of you know, I do a lot of wide angle work. It's particularly acute when you're shooting at 660 millimeter focal length because that's pretty high magnification and that's what the telescope gives. When you're shooting with um, lenses of between 35 millimeter, which is sort of ultra wide angle, and 200 millimeters, um, the, the lack of polar alignment and the slippage that you get is not as apparent nearly in the finished images. And so I thought really that, that I would probably get close to nothing, but I did get something. And some of you may have seen some of these. And so in the, uh, in the evening, this is always so, so pretty, you know, as uh, looking to the west as twilight is, uh, is descending, uh, what do we get there? Well, these are not going to be necessarily familiar to many of you. Uh, and so this is what I do. So what we have here is is the Southern Cross in constellation Crux, the smallest constellation uh, in the sky. The, what's called the Coal Sack. We have a so-called Northern Coal Sack uh, in Cygnus, uh, which straddles uh, Centaurus and Crux, and then um, Alpha and Beta Centauri, two very bright stars that are real signposts to a Southern Cross. And then over here, Omega Centauri. You'll see another photograph of that. Used to be classified as a globular cluster. It it is probably not a globular cluster, but rather, as it says here, uh, the a dwarf galaxy remnant uh, distorted, um, even though it is within our Milky Way. Uh, and so this is a, just a, you know, a, a really pretty view. One of the things that I was able to capture, and it was terrific at this time of year, because the ecliptic down there makes a very steep angle with the horizon, and I was able to get the zodiacal light. It was just, you know, I was setting up and getting ready, turned around and looked to the west. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. This is 40 kilometers south of Alice Springs, right in the outback. There are no lights whatsoever. And so it was very clear that it was the zodiacal light, this great pyramid that I was looking at, and up here again, at Antares and, uh, and Scorpius. So it's a really nice way to start, uh, th and that's one single exposure, to, to start uh, the evening. And so I started, and this time of year in September, um, Crux is very close to the horizon, it's close to setting, and you gotta work really fast to get it. Um, and indeed, this, the, and this shot, Crux in this entire field, was only about 12 to 15 degrees above the horizon, believe it or not. And so it's quite amazing, actually, to be able to get a, a photograph with this kind of contrast uh, at that altitude. And so uh, here we have the cross again and the coal sack. And the, the, the ones in green are all open clusters here. And there are just many of them strewn through the Milky Way in this, uh, in this part. And then uh, an emission nebula, the so-called running chicken uh, nebula. So I really, like, uh, I really like Crux a lot. That's what the camera lens, by the way. Um, and um, fairly close. Actually, I'm going to try to go back here and see whether... Yeah, okay. So right here you see the jewel box, which is very close to Mimosa very bright star and it's a really really pretty open cluster so I then photographed it uh, with the uh, teleview refractor and it's just such a, a pretty fairly densely uh, packed uh, open star cluster of quite bright stars 
And here we have Alpha and Beta Centauri. This again is with a with a 200 millimeter camera lens, uh, and you can see they actually have quite different uh, colors here. Uh, and it's right in the middle, <coughs> pardon me, uh, of the Milky Way. So I'm going to label it uh, again, and we see you know these various uh, open star clusters here. Um, a little um, Gum was a, uh, an astronomer who uh, did cataloging of emission nebulae in the southern hemisphere, and here's just a very very small one uh, right here. But this photograph is, I've been trying to do this for a long time. This photograph shows something else. And I've been trying to get a photograph from which I could identify something pretty interesting. And that is Proxima Centauri. I finally found a photograph in a finder chart for Proxima Centauri and hoped that I, a, a, well, I knew that I had caught it here. But I didn't know whether I could possibly identify it. And I did and uh, found a, a finder chart, fo photo finder chart, that had all of these stars. And there we go. So it's an 11th magnitude star, uh, the closest star to our solar system. It's actually just slightly closer, although it orbits uh, um, Regal Cantoris, also known as Alpha, or what used to be called Alpha Centauri. Um, it orbits it in a very, very long uh, orbit, but it is now slightly closer, and so, and, and it will be for the rest of our lives. And uh, so that was a, a little bit of a highlight, actually being able to find that and to identify it. And uh, then we go on to, um, this, is, this is actually really interesting. I, I processed this and put it up on my Flickr page recently. Um, up to, some of you will have read this, I didn't know this until I was actually doing the research for this. Here are the, the, the two uh, open clusters. Up to 10% of all open clusters in, uh, in the Milky Way and indeed in the large Magellanic and small Magellanic clouds are actually binaries. They are uh, at about the same distance, about the same age, and they, and they revolve around each other. I didn't know that until recently, and these two are a, a, a good example of that. And here is a, a little emission nebula um, catalog by uh, um, uh, Pismus. Um, one of the things I'm, I've really developed an interest in is dark nebulae and photographing them, and this scope is actually pretty good for that. And so here is just one. I'd never tried it before. Uh, the B stands for uh, Barnard, um, uh, E. E. Barnard, American astronomer, who did most of, most but not all of the cataloging of the most obvious uh, uh, dark nebulae uh, in the Milky Way. And this one is really, I, I, I really like this. This is the first time I actually managed to get a, a, a very good higher magnification photograph. The dark doodad, a very scientific name. It was first um, identified uh, by Dennis DeChico of Sky and Telescope magazine in 1986 when he went down to see a solar eclipse. He photographed that, wondered what the heck it was. He couldn't find it, so he called it the dark doodad, and it's, uh, it's really quite prominent. So I decided to take a picture of that one, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, lots of open clusters throughout this entire uh, area. Um, and this, of course, is our famous M7. Now, now, M M M7 is a very bright open cluster. It's very obvious in binoculars as seen from the northern hemisphere. Um, and you may be a little surprised here because it doesn't jump out at us in this photo in the same way as it does visually when we look uh, either naked eye or in binoculars. And that is because with the long exposure, all of the faint background stars are really brought up and the telescope is good enough that it concentrates the light of the brighter stars and doesn't expand it too much. And so they don't get brighter, they get saturated, the fainter stars come up and tend to hide the brighter stars. Right? And so you can really see that here. Uh, you do not see, uh, visually or in, or in binoculars, uh, any, any of the dark nebulosity, the foreground nebulosity here. But it's a pretty interesting view of a very well-known Messier object. And then uh, this, you saw the one uh, that I did from Algonquin Park. So here is an equivalent photograph uh, in, the, uh, in the southern hemisphere of M24, um, open, open cluster. I wanted to see what that looked like. And everybody knows, uh, knows this one. It, it's, it's so interesting that you get an emission nebula and a reflection nebula so close to each other with very, very different, uh, very different colors. I've got a much higher magnification 
uh, photograph of that of this taken with uh, the 152 millimeter six inch uh, f8 telescope that has a a uh, a much larger um, uh, magnification, but uh, I thought that this one uh, turned out actually fairly well. You can see the the uh, the trifid, the three, the, well, the trifurcation of the nebula cause apparently caused by the foreground lanes of dark gas here. This, by the way, is inverted. M8 is up. Inverted from the northern hemisphere point of view, but obviously not from the southern hemisphere point of view. So south is up in this view. And then we get to the globular clusters. Uh, M22, which is the second brightest globular cluster in the sky, just off the top of uh, the teapot. A beautiful cluster. It never gets actually all that high here, but you can get decent photographs from the northern hemisphere, but way better in, uh, in the south. Uh, I really like this one a lot. Even brighter and larger is uh, 47 Tucani, which is very near the small Magellanic cloud. And this is the best photograph I've managed to get of that. And one, th this was a real challenge. Well, first of all, because this was on a night when, when uh, the, the mount was just horribly aligned, I could tell from the photos. You're gonna find this hard to believe. This is through the, obviously through the refractor. This is one single frame, 15 second exposure. Uh, and that's what you can get. And one of the one of the challenges of this object is that it is extremely highly concentrated in the center. And so you really, um, it, it, to, if you want to have a long enough exposure to get some of the fainter outer members, it just burns in the core. So it took some fancy processing uh, in order actually to be able to see into the center and resolve it down almost, not quite, but almost to the middle. And then we get Omega Centauri, again, no longer considered to be a, um, and this is, it, it's much, much larger, no longer considered to be a globular cluster, but it has a lot of the uh, characteristics and visually it looks exactly like a globular cluster. So I wanted to get those three and uh, managed to. And so uh, one of the things that I really like to do, uh, you know, when you're down there in the Milky Way straight overhead, although in September it's getting into the west, so you got to work really fast, uh, is to uh, photograph the center of the Milky Way. And I have turned this around so it is familiar to us, the orientation with north, uh, with north up. Uh, and this is actually, this is really, uh, really interesting. I'm going to show, we have Jupiter up here and we have Saturn uh, down there. Now, um, we heard that next December, when they're almost behind the sun, by the way, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are gonna be really, really close together. And that is true. If any of you read what I wrote, um, I think either earlier this week or last week about this photograph in particular, we will not get an opportunity to see this. That is Jupiter and Saturn together over the Milky Way for another 300 years. So this is it. And I was really lucky to be able to be in a position in the Southern Hemisphere to be able to get a photograph of something that will not be seen. It will not be seen after this year. So there we go. And, uh, and here, of course, we have the, uh, the ecliptic. And, and what, what um, this shows as well, when you consider the ecliptic, the, the galactic equator goes along, along here. And so the galaxy, our solar system, with the planets going around it, is inclined or tipped about 60 degrees to the axis of our galaxy. So if we think of our galaxy this way, our solar system is doing this. Well, we don't normally think about that, and there's no reason why it shouldn't. But not everything in the galaxy revolves, uh, rotates in the same way. And so this is actually a pretty graphic uh, illustration of exactly that. Okay, and then obviously we got the teapot down here and then the, the, the bright cluster uh, M22. So we then go on, uh, this, this is the teapot. This is really interesting. The, the, we think of Sagittarius as being sort of the heart of the Milky Way, and that is true, although Scorpius and Ophiuchus as well. Scorpius is just kind of outside, most of it is outside uh, the Milky Way to the west, but the teapot is outside the main bulge of the Milky Way to the east, and so the main bulge is actually through north, uh, northwestern Sagittarius and Ophiuchus. And here you can see, all right, you know, obviously uh, the, the central bulge, and there's a lot, just because of the way I 
was able to do the processing. There's just such a lot of detail there uh, with all of the uh, little tendrils of dark foreground gas. And the teapot itself is there. So we have, there we have the ecliptic and Saturn. We have M22, the large globular cluster, all sorts of open, uh, open clusters here. Uh, and then lots of dark uh, nebulae, a lot of which are not named uh, at all. And uh, I've actually never never gotten uh, this photograph before, and so I was fairly pleased with it. And then the, the fairly familiar uh, globular clusters in the Messier catalog that are very low in the, in the sky uh, where, where we are. And uh, so... Again, the teapot, this is just a little bit uh, f further west, and there is the actual center of the galaxy. It's hidden by foreground dark gas. If, we were able to, if, if that weren't there, we would see a big bright uh, bulge um, and just a whole bunch of detail all the way uh, through here. And... Uh, Okay, these are very familiar, uh, M16 and 17, and then, uh, then um, the Triffid Nebula, Nebula and Lagoon and Nebula, uh, an area of the sky I really do like an awful lot. And uh, again, closer in, in uh, uh, yes, uh, the Scorpius-Sagittarius border, here we see the galactic center again, and uh, a lot of detail in, in, uh, in this area. And then this is really, really interesting. Uh, Bod's window, it's right in here. This is an area, and I didn't know this until recently when I did some research, where there's virtually no um, foreground gas, and we can see right through almost to the center of, of our galaxy, of the Milky Way. Uh, and uh, so I thought that this would be pretty interesting to, uh, to, to photograph. Now, this is one of the ones I really like, the Pipe Nebula, Dark Nebula. It's part of the so-called Horse Dark Nebula that you can see in Scorpius. Uh, and I really like this one. It's, it's quite a dramatic one when you get into a good dark sky, right on the Ophiuchus Sagittarius border. M19 globular cluster up there. Now you can see, you, you can see here, right? These are not, these are trailed a little bit. You know, it, it's it's not a, a great astrophoto by any means, and we know this. So the Magellanic clouds are getting close to the end here. So this is taken with a, a 50 millimeter lens, standard lens, and it shows you how uh, how far apart they are. Obviously, the small one with 47 tucani, the the um, brightest globular cluster in the sky, very close to the small Magellanic cloud, and then the large one over here with the Tarantula Nebula, which is a challenge to photograph, but pretty interesting to try. Right, and that gives you then an idea where it's 20 degrees. So, so really what we're talking about is they're about 20 degrees apart in the sky. And obviously, you know, we're getting really close down here to the south celestial pole. And so they, they spin around really close to the south pole over the course of an evening. And so we get to the small Magellanic Cloud. And just to, to remind ourselves, so it's about that distance from us. Our Milky Way galaxy has a diameter of about 106,000 light years. So if we think about our Milky Way galaxy, you know, let's say 100,000 light years, the small Magellanic Cloud is located twice that distance away. It's really close. As compared with uh, M31, for example, that's between three and four million light years away, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. And uh, here we are with the small Magellanic Cloud. And uh, I have the star atlas that uh, allows me to um, identify a lot of objects, uh, open clusters and diffuse nebulae in the small Magellanic Cloud. Something like this takes me hours to do to be able to coordinate with you know, what I'm actually seeing in, in the star atlas. And then somewhat closer to us, 160,000 or 63,000 light years away, twice the diameter of the small Magellanic Cloud is the large Magellanic Cloud. Um, and I've never gotten a really good photo of this with a decent uh, focal length telescope uh, until this time. And so I'm, I was pretty happy with this. What's really interesting is that those colors that you see 
are I, I was I was very suspicious about them. You see a lot of light blue, which tends to indicate very hot stars and very young, uh, very young stars. And I thought, well, wait a minute, you know, is that actually you know the real color? Then I took a look at photographs from the European Southern Observatory. And they're the same colors, and these are true colors. They're not. They're not false color images, and so that is what you get. And we have here the detail in the uh, in the tarantula nebula in the large Magellanic cloud. So, this uh, for sure is is it, and it's always a sort of a stunning uh, view. Um, there we get it. Uh, this is the largest, well, the highest magnification photo I've <coughs> been able to get of this object. And uh, I quite like that one uh, a lot. It really is uh, gorgeous to see. Difficult to catch. I had to wait until um, until 4 o'clock in the morning until it had risen high enough in the southeast in order to get it. Even so, it was only about 20 degrees above the horizon when I managed to do this one. Very interesting star at the center, um, uh, A. A. Decrini itself, a sort of a cataclysmic variable that has gone through changes uh, over the course of the, about the past century and a half. Um, at, at, at one point in the 1800s, rising to the second brightest star in the sky after Sirius, and then going up and down and finally fading back to magnitude uh, 6. And so I'll finish up uh, with this one. This is an even wider angle view with the 35 millimeter lens of our galaxy, the central bulge. And here we can see, all right, this, so this is the pipe nebula. And if you turn, if you sort of turn your head, you can see the horse shape, the head, the back, the front legs, the back legs, all right? Oh yeah, and uh, Jupiter, <laughs> the horse uh, prancing on Jupiter. I really do like that a lot, and it really just, uh, it, it's so unbelievable to see it uh, high, uh, high in the sky. So there you go. And with that, I will thank you again for inviting me. <laughs> Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> and how are we doing for time? A couple of minutes. No, nope, probably no. No, no, no. You can you can just do sign. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now it's on. Um, does the taking all these photographs over the years, does the volume of or the number of stars out there, nebula and galaxies, does that ever? get to you in a different way over time? That's a really good question, and I'm going to say yes, but I think that, I, I think there may be a couple of reasons for that. It, I've, I've, I've never said this except maybe to a close friend. It's very emotional when you're out there. Uh, it really is, and especially in the Australian outback. You know, I can hear creatures all around me at night and you know I'm seeing wallabies jumping around, and I'm close to Uluru. Um, it's re it's really magical. So there's an enormous you know I've talked about the you know, technical stuff and so on with these photographs, but it's the beauty of them, and there's a huge amount of emotion. And I find as well that I have a different reaction as I get older, because I you know how many more of these trips am I going to going to have? Uh, you know, I'm a senior citizen. And, uh, you know, how, for how much longer, for example, in Algonquin, am I going to be able to take those huge components of my astrophysics mount and actually put them together and so on in the night and then disassemble them and then drive back to Toronto? I don't know. And so there's kind of that realization as well. Um, so that, that's one aspect. That's a really, really good question. And that's part of an answer. Okay. All right. And maybe that actually is a, okay, one more. <laughs> Amazing talk, Michael. Thank you. Oh, thank you. How do you determine where to set up? And are you alone? 
Uh, okay, I'll answer the second one uh, first. Am I alone? Um, yes and no. There are no humans anywhere near me, but there are lots of animals. Uh, absolutely for sure. Um, but no, I, and, and that actually is a really good question. Um, I have seen Alice Springs, a little town of Alice Springs, expand in its, its uh, light uh, output since 2015. I had an observing site 20 kilometers outside Alice Springs. It's too bright now. So then I had to go down the Stewart Highway 40 kilometers to the south so that I'd be looking south. It's kind of like uh, Gravenhurst and Torrance Barrens. I don't go to Torrance Barrens anymore. It's not a dark si sky site anymore. It just is not. Uh, it's okay, but it's not any good for astrophotography anymore. And so, yeah, it, uh, you know, it takes some scouting and, and driving. You know, as so I head out and I'm, you know, with my wife and daughter and we're sort of doing other than astrophotography. So I'm up all night, get to my site, drive back, get out of bed for an hour, get up and then we're sort of touring all day. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's nice to come back and get a vacation from the vacation. Uh, with Uluru, that's different because um, they really do a good job in keeping the light down. And so I can be only 12 kilometers from Uluru and I, and I actually don't see any light there at all. So that's a really good question about, about getting the sights. But the problem is the spin effects and all the stuff, um, you know, and the thorns and all of that. And, you know, it's kind of annoying and scrapes you all up. So that, that is a, that's a tricky thing to do. But luckily with uh, Google Earth, I can get a pretty good idea where I want to go and I've got maps and so on before I go and then sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But I've also been to these areas before and so I have a favorite spot near Uluru right where a car is turned over and burned out and has been for years. So I know when I see it, oh, that's my site. <laughs> okay, uh, I think maybe we'll bring it to an end. We're at, at the end of our time. So again, thank you. <laughs>